If you're joining us on Facebook Live today, I'm glad that you are worshiping with us. Um, I do want to share with you, if you couldn't tell, there's a special event that starts this evening. And it could be VBS. It just could be. I, and there is, what is it, what is it called? The Gazelle Bell. I will have another name for that by the end of the week, and it may rhyme, but I don't know. From the well, right? The gazelle bell from the well. Yeah, something like that. All right. VBS starts tonight, 5.30 to 8 o'clock. Um, it is going to be a great week. Uh, there are so many people that have been getting things ready. Um, Brandy is inviting anybody who's working, anybody who wants to stay uh, after the service to meet down in the fellowship hall, and she's going to lead in time of prayer as we get ready for Vacation Bible School. So uh, after you visit in here a little bit, head on down that way, and we'll say a prayer and then get you on your way to lunch. Um, it's going to be fun. It is going to be fun. Don't forget to invite your kids and your friends' kids and your kids, friends, and all of those people. Um, I am glad to be back this morning. It was great to get away last week. Uh, my mom is doing well, and it was great for us to get the chance to see her and uh, uh, share with her a little bit of time. So, But it is always good to be back at St. Paul, and uh, 
I have a, a, a special announcement this morning for you. Most of you know um, that today, where did he run off to? Did he go all the way? He went, Oh, there he is back there. Uh, to, yeah, you, you're, you're trying to hide. It's not going to work. Today is Mark's last Sunday as our full-time music director after 35 and a half years. Can you imagine that? 35 and a half years. Doesn't seem like a day over 10, does it, Mark? Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, we have all been blessed by Mark and, and his ministry and by Sandy and uh, their presence here at St. Paul. And so I've invited Gene Shook to come and, and say a, a couple of words on behalf of the Staff Parish Committee. Uh, Mark, I'm going to invite you to come back up as well. You, and Sandy, if you want to come with him, you can. If you don't want to, you can just sit right there. I don't blame you. Uh, but Mark, come on back up. I, we'll get you back over at this microphone. Perfect. Good morning. On behalf of Sandy Hill Parish Church, I'd like to the whole congregation, Mark, I just want to congratulate you, first of all, on 35 years, and to thank you for the service that you've given to St. Paul and its people for all this time. Um, you've been a mentor to many, many people. You've been a friend to all of us, and um, really, you've been the glue that's held a lot of it together for a lot of years, and uh, we're grateful that you've been here. I just wanted to share maybe just a few things that how, how Mark has blessed my family through the years, and I think that you'll recognize a lot of these same things as blessings in your family as well. Um, a long time ago, I think this was BS, which is before Sandy, and that's a long time ago. <laughs> uh, we, we, <laughs> we, we started a group... Um, Sunrise Singers in first service, and and it was a it was a choir. It was an official choir. Not many of us had a lot of official choir experience, and Mark taught us and kind of pushed us along, and really made us feel like we were contributing to the worship experience. And it was certainly probably a greater blessing to us than than to the congregation. But that was my first taste of, of real church music. And then, you know, we all kind of grew, and of course we had children, and these children were coming up, and when they were when they were littles, they went to music camp, and Mark was there, and we felt good because Mark was there. And then they grew into teens, and were in youth, and there were those magical youth choir tours that were but, well, they're priceless. They couldn't be replaced. I have to share a story. My daughter, who's well past youth now, uh, she was moving a few years back, and I was helping her pack, and I was working on a closet, and there was this Coke bottle. And in this Coke bottle were these fuzzy pom-pom things stuck down in there with a lid on it. I said, Lauren, you want this? Mom, that's my warm fuzzies. I can't get rid of those. They're right there with the confirmation banner in the most precious things box. That was the result of the devotionals that Mark led during youth choir tour. I don't really know exactly what the warm fuzzies, what you get to get one, but they're important. But uh, after that, when, when my husband David retired and, and he was kind of missing the leading of a musical group. Uh, he'd done that for a long time, and then all of a sudden he's not. Um, you know, again, Mark, who has this uncanny ability to just figure out what people need and give it to them, he says, hey, why don't you uh, take a hand at directing Christ Chimes? I think, you'll, I think you'll like it. It turned out to be the greatest thing, great blessing. David has had a lot of fun with, with his uh, bell ringers. And then kind of full circle back in first service when I retired, um, we have a little we, we have a little group collective, it's a collective of people who are real singers, but I'm kind of just in over my head, but Mark was kind enough to let me be with that group as well. And 
We have a lot of fun. So, Mark, thank you. Uh, we look forward to you continuing to share your gifts with us in worship, but I just will part with saying you have, you have been a real example of a disciple making disciples. And if you don't believe that, just look out here. I, I was thinking about that very thing during the opening music. Um, I remember when many of these were in the church nursery, and you brought them along, and here they are. So, thank you. Well, thank you all very much. And um, 35 years seems like a long time, but uh, it's only because I finally found a congregation that would accept me, not kick me out, and uh, and nobody else ever wanted me, so it, it worked out great, so, you know, thank you all very much, I, I appreciate those kind words, Jeannie, and I appreciate every one of you, and and don't forget, we've got those wonderful youth choir tours and mission trips, you got a wonderful past youth director back there in the back, Laurie Sawyer, and you got a wonderful present youth director right down here, Brandy, and so, because we wear them out pretty quick, so, uh, <laughs> But thank you all. Well deserved. Well deserved. And I too want to add my, my congratulation and my thanks. Uh, my 13 years here, which I'm beginning to realize how they kept you that long. Because, you know, they just find a place to stick us where we can't do any more harm. Um, but my 13 years here have been blessed because of the two of you. Um, and I am so appreciative. Uh, you have an opportunity as a church, if you hadn't seen it already, to sign a banner that is out front for Mark and Sandy. Um, you can give cards or whatever out there as well. Um, we are, we have taken a collection, but Heather, the treasurer, the check writer is out of town, so the check's in the mail. Um, I was very pleased to uh, present Mark with a special gift um, on my behalf and behalf of the staff parish committee. Uh, we are, we have uh, set aside some time for Mark to get away to a place in Missouri called Indian Creek uh, for a guided smallmouth bass fishing trip. Uh, lodging and meals included and um, so I know that we're going to be working on getting that date set and getting him up there to do some fishing but Mark, Sandy, thank you so much um, every bit of thanks and praise is deserved because I know that you both share your gifts for one reason um, and that is to give glory to God and that's what matters most so thank you very much well you're probably wondering where that uh, gift certificate was that you gave me but I I kept it right next to my heart, heart, heart. There it is. Oh. An old, old joke. <laughs> but thank you, and Sandy, you left too soon. Come back. This is my greatest asset right here. So I would say, come on, dear. <laughs> I would say that she's the best career move I've ever made, but that wouldn't sound real good either, so, uh, <laughs> but hey dear, we're going this way. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Another opportunity for you to get out fished, right? If she goes with you. We love each other. We do. We really do. Um, let's go to God in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we are grateful, grateful that you give gifts and talents to, to your people. And you call them into ministry and they hear and they obey and they serve. We are truly grateful today for Mark and for Sandy and for the many ways they have blessed us and blessed our community. Um, you have definitely used them to make a difference. So we say thank you. We, get, we gather today as a church to celebrate their ministry, but more than that, to celebrate how their ministry has brought glory to you. For that's what it's been about. And we know that 
uh, as we celebrate that, that you call each and every one of us to our own ministries. And each one is different, each one is unique, but each one is useful and meaningful and purposeful for your kingdom. And so, Lord, we, we pray that we will be open to your leading and your guiding so that we might continue to do the work that you have called us and equipped us to do so that people will know that you are our God and indeed your steadfast love endures forever. And for this we are truly thankful. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior, the one who taught us to pray in this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And it is time for children's moments. Do we have any kids that are going to come forward today for children's moments? Got a couple. Got a couple. How are y'all? Good. Good? Are you really good? Are they really good? <laughs> I know they're really good. Um, it is great to be here today. Um, y'all, Are y'all excited about Vacation Bible School? Yes. Have you seen all the work that has gone on already in decorating and getting ready for y'all to come and enjoy Vacation Man, it's awesome, isn't it? Big waterfall back here and big tree back here. Oh man, we're gonna roar this week, aren't we? We're gonna roar. And you know what I, I, I'm talking about today is roaring with gratitude. Do y'all know what gratitude is? Have you ever heard that word, gratitude? Do you know what it means? What do, what what do we do when we're grateful for something? Oh, what? we say, oh he's got it. We say thank you. And today we are talking about gratitude, that God loves us and God is at work in our lives all the time and that he uses other people um, to, to make a difference in, in our lives and that we are supposed to say thank you to God. One of, the, one of the ways we can do that is by coming to Vacation Bible School and telling the people who have worked so hard to make it happen, thank you, right? And another way we can do that is to say, okay, God, I get it. You've given me gifts of love and grace, and you're right here with me, and I am going to follow you and say thank you to God. Um, and that's what God wants us to do. God wants us to be grateful for all his love and live like that love makes a difference. Now, I know, because y'all are my neighbors, I get to see y'all all the time. I know that both of y'all are living with God's love all the time. I've seen you draw hearts on the sidewalk. I've seen you talking to our neighbors and sharing with our neighbors and being friendly. Um, it is so cool because I know that that's your way of being grateful for what God has done. All of us are called to be grateful for what God has done for us and to live in a way that we share thank yous with each other uh, for God, what God's done. So y'all just keep on sharing, okay? All right. And we're going to see y'all at VBS tonight. Lincoln, are you coming to VBS? All right. We'll see you tonight. Uh, let's go to God in prayer. Dear God, thank you for loving us and giving us Jesus and giving us love and giving us so much. Help us be thankful and to live our lives in ways that show your love to others. Amen. All right. We'll see y'all later, okay? Cool. Heading off to shine. Now, 
I know y'all were watching the kids go out just then. Did you notice? I was on the floor and I got up. This week is much better than last week or the week before. Whew. All right. Before I start, um, I want to give you a little bit of an update on last night's Bands for Babies Benefit. It was the sixth annual. We had three great bands. We had the Remnants. We had Don Bailey uh, Jazz Combo. We had Even Kill. And they were, they were fantastic. And we had a huge crowd. And, um, and people were very, very generous. And without the silent auction, which, by the way, it was so nice to not worry about a silent auction. But without the silent auction, we still raised over $1,500 for Dr. Bailey. <laughs> Part of, part of what we were doing is saying thank you to all those who have supported us. Um, so if you've ever supported uh, Dr. Dandies in any way, even if it's just a prayer, we are truly grateful for all that you've done that make it possible for us to serve our community. We are sitting at 2,799 babies served in our six years. That is that's just fantastic. Now, one of the things that happened uh, last night uh, Richard Nixon, uh, drummer for the Remnants and uh, future in-law, um, <laughs> put his lovely bandana hair hat up for auction, and uh, the auction wasn't going real fast. There wasn't a whole lot of bids, and somebody, somebody said, I'll give $50 for it, but Pastor Steve has to wear it in the service tomorrow. I said, okay, I'll do it. So I got up to the microphone and I said, but $50 only pays for one service. Guess what? I wore it in first service, and I'm true to my word, and y'all know this is not a stretch for me. I'm pretty silly and crazy most of the time anyway. This little hairy hat raised $120 last night. So, I will be preaching with a head of hair. Blonde hair. Let's go to God in prayer. Lord, I think you, you like it when we laugh. When we're filled with joy. Even amidst the struggles in our world. And it doesn't mean we don't see them. It doesn't mean we're ignoring them. It means that deep down inside we know that there is always hope in you. And we always have gifts to be grateful for that come from you. So as we laugh, as we share, as we listen today, speak to us again. Speak in spite of my hair. Amen. I gotta get the camera right. And people need to what? <laughs> I forgot I, I Nathan was covering Sarah up and I forgot to mention we had another wonderful past youth director in here as well. And I just wanted to make sure that she was recognized as one of our past <laughs> Uh, you can go on now. <laughs> There'll be a staff meeting right after the prayer meeting, staff parish meeting. Um, thank you for doing that. Yes, Sarah, you are in that long line without a doubt. Um, thank you, Mark, for that. Oh, uh, let's see. Where do we start today, right? This, Richard, I don't know how you do this for two, for almost two hours in the heat. Because this thing, this thing, it stinks too. No. We can do this though, we're almost family. Uh, all right, 10%. 10%. Doesn't sound like a whole lot, does it? You just think about it, 10% doesn't sound that hard to achieve. Doesn't really even sound like something to strive for. Um, you know, it's just one out of 10. 
one out of ten. If a baseball hitter, baseball player, only gets a hit one out of every ten trips to the plate, how long does he stay in the lineup? <laughs> he doesn't. That's right. He doesn't. He's only batting a hundred. That, that doesn't work on much of any level. If a pass receiver in football uh, only catches one out of every ten passes that's thrown to him, they call him Butterfingers and they set him on the bench and the quarterback starts throwing to somebody else. If a tennis player only returns one out of every ten serves, it's a real quick game, set, match, isn't it? It just doesn't last very long. One out of ten. Now, I was always taught that no matter what I did, I was supposed to give how much? Ten percent? No, a hundred percent. So ten percent doesn't, it, it just doesn't get it done. Doesn't sound like much until the preacher says it. Right? When a preacher says 10%, it sounds like a whole lot more. Especially when he says something about giving and 10%. Because <coughs> suddenly, one out of every 10 seems a little bit harder to give. One out of every ten. Maybe, maybe that's why the average family, the average United Methodist family in Arkansas gives two percent. Two percent. That's a statewide average of United Methodists who give to the church. They give two percent. <coughs> the percentage of hours given to God, I would dare say that it wouldn't even go to 10% level. It'd be right along that 2% level as well. Um, let's see. One hour for worship. One hour for Sunday school. Let's throw in an hour just in case you're doing a Bible study during the week. Maybe another hour when you do your, your, you're adding up your morning prayers, your evening prayers. Okay, I'm talking about myself here, okay? I'm just, just going to throw out those numbers. Four hours. Four hours. That's out of 24 per day at seven days per week, which is a total of 168. Okay, 3%. 3%. But I'm going to give you all a break today. I'm going to give you a break. Because guess what? Even though my sermon is called Be a Ten Percenter, it's not about giving. It's not about giving your money. It's not about giving your time. It's not about giving your resources so you can relax. You can just take a big sigh of relief. It's not about offering. I want to hear the collective sigh of relief. <sighs> but don't get your hopes up either. Because it's not about being a slacker. It's not about saying, well, I can only give 10% of effort in my walk with Christ. No, it's about having the kind of faith that was shown by one man, a, a single leper, one of 10, whom Jesus healed on his way to Jerusalem one day. Now, this miraculous story is found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. Not long after the disciples had asked Jesus to give them more faith. They said, we want more faith. And his response was, there's really no more or less in faith. You either have it or you don't have it. It's kind of like Yoda and trying. There is no try. It's do or do not. Jesus says, there, there is no level. You either have faith or you don't have it. And they said, well, we need it. And, and then by chance, just by chance. Okay, it's Jesus. Maybe it wasn't by chance. Jesus and his disciples are traveling along the border of Galilee and Samaria, and the disciples get to witness what it means to have faith. I'm reading from the message today. Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. It happened that as he made his way toward Jerusalem, he crossed over the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten men, all lepers, met him. 
They kept their distance, but raised their voices, calling out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Taking a good look at them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priest. They went, and while, the, while still on their way, became clean. One of them, when he realized that he was healed, turned around and came back, shouting his gratitude, glorifying God. He kneeled at Jesus' feet, so grateful, he couldn't thank him enough. And he was a Samaritan. Everybody go, eww. Because okay? that's what you do with a Samaritan. Jesus said, were not ten healed? Where are the nine? Can none be found to come back and give glory to God except this outsider? Then he said to him, Get up on your way. Your faith has healed and saved you. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now there's a couple of things I want to, us to remember um, so we talk about this story of the ten lepers. First, lepers were outcasts. You know that. Lepers were outcasts. They were forced to live in groups outside the city walls with other lepers. It's the only place they could be. They weren't allowed in the marketplaces. They weren't allowed in their families' homes. They weren't allowed in the synagogues. And especially, they weren't allowed in the temple. They, they couldn't come to church couldn't be with anybody else except other lepers. If they met somebody on the road, they were supposed to yell out, unclean, 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 so that the people on the road would pass by on the other side, steer clear of them and stay away from their illness. Most people wouldn't even look at them. They would turn their eyes away. It didn't matter where you came from. It didn't matter what your social status was. If you contracted leprosy in any of its various forms, now look, I, I, I did some weed eating the other day, and I had short, I had boots and shorts, and so I have these bumps right here from the weed eating, from either an allergic reaction or chiggers. That would have been considered leprosy because they itch and they ooze. Okay. I would, have been in the, I would have been outside the city walls. That's how bad it was. If you contracted leprosy in any of its forms, you were reduced to a life of poverty. Begging for alms from passerbys on the street and just hoping, hoping for some kind of mercy. Now, second thing we need to remember is that the priest, the Jewish priest, had all the power and all the authority to declare whether someone was clean or unclean. So I might have these bumps, but until the priest saw them and said, you're unclean, I'd still be okay if I could hide them. Or if they went away, it was not until the priest saw them and said, okay, you're clean. They had the power, all of it. The religious authorities, by their judgment, could basically take life away from somebody or grant life to somebody. For a diagnosis of leprosy resulted in a chilling condemnation from the Jewish leaders. And then even if someone were healed, it took a declaration from the very same priest for that person to be fully restored to life, to the position they were in, to the status they were in before that dreaded disease hit. So life as a leper in first century Palestine, it wasn't pleasant at all. Not at all. And the hope of every leper was to be presented to, to, before the priest and to undergo the cleansing rituals and then to be pronounced as clean. As clean. And thereby permitted to return to worship and to return to family and to return to life itself. Ten such lepers lined the road outside of a village on the way to Jerusalem, heartbroken and pitiful and, and shamefully avoiding contact with strangers and friends and even family as they, as they begged for relief of any kind. 
Now, we're not told how they recognized Jesus or how they knew Jesus. We're just told that as he walked by, that they kept their distance, as any good leper would do, and they joined their voices together and shouted for him, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. I've always wondered, was it really an act of faith or was it just desperation? Did they single Jesus out for a reason or had they been asking for help and mercy from every person who walked by? I mean, they're kind of like our panhandlers on the street corner all over town, right? They're just begging for mercy. Begging for mercy. We don't know the answer, but but we can surmise that Jesus probably wasn't the first one to hear their cries that day. But here was the difference. Jesus, Scripture tells us, instead of turning his head away and shielding his eyes in disgust, took a good look at them. He saw them. And when he saw them, he saw them in their misery, and he recognized their pain. And in compassion, then, he took action. He did something. He asked them to take a step of faith. He asked them to go and, and, and show themselves to the priest. Now, notice this. Notice this in the Scripture. They had not been healed yet. He said... Go and show yourselves to the priest. He hadn't said anything about them being cleansed. He hadn't said anything about healing. He just said, go. It was not until they were on their way that the leprosy disappears. But each of those ten, in that moment of desperation, with just a, a, a glimpse of hope, obeyed Jesus and headed toward the village. And boom, ten miracles. Ten, we'd like to see one, wouldn't we? Ten miracles. Ten lives changed. Ten outcasts restored. Ten out of ten. By the way, that's 100%, just in case you're having trouble with your math. That's batting a thousand. The best baseball players batting the 300s. Jesus is batting a thousand. Ten out of ten. And that's good news. It's good news for you, it's good news for me, because it tells us that Jesus sees our distress. That Jesus sees the things that suck the life right out of us. That Jesus knows every one of our troubles, and 100% of the time, Jesus cares. Jesus cares. It's also pretty good evidence of the power Jesus has to change lives. I mean, in this case, he, he, he truly was batting a thousand. Ten out of ten. And the story could have ended right there, and that would have been cool, wouldn't it? I mean, think about it. Just the impact of ten miraculous healings at once made a compelling case that Jesus was the compassionate, merciful, powerful, healing Messiah. If that happened right here, that's all we need to see. We'd be in awe. But the story doesn't end there, does it? Now, this is what I find truly interesting in this particular story, is that Jesus makes no pronouncements or no declarations of healing or clean, cleansing for these ten lepers, either before or when they were cleansed. Jesus didn't say, you're healed now. He didn't say, you're saved now. It just happened. He just made a simple request that they go and show themselves to the earthly authority to have them reinstated into life. Now certainly, ten miracles took place on that road, and certainly ten lives were impacted by Jesus' power as surely as rotting flesh and oozing sores of leprosy disappeared. All ten of those outcasts Experience the healing touch of Jesus Christ. But as the story goes, only one, only one out of ten 
when he saw that he was clean, stopped dead in his tracks and turned around and, and went back to Jesus and threw himself on the ground at Jesus' feet and thanked him profusely, giving glory to God for that miracle. Only one. Only one. One out of ten. What's that? Ten percent? One out of ten. Only one out of ten. Only one out of ten recognize the gift and then express gratitude for receiving that gift. And that one was a, let's say, get it, uh, Samaritan. You put in whatever person or persons or type of person you want to into that, into that story. That person was in. That one. person whom the Jews would have said you worship in the wrong way you worship the wrong God you worship the wrong place you worship the wrong time you've got it all messed up and yet when that one Samaritan fell before Jesus in gratitude then and only then did Jesus make a proclamation and tell him to get up and go on his way because his faith had both healed and saved him. A proclamation Jesus didn't make when all ten had turned toward the village to go see the priest. A proclamation Jesus didn't make when all ten were cleansed. A proclamation made only when that Samaritan man expressed his faith by returning to give thanks and praise to God. True. All ten lepers were made clean. And they had their lives restored by the earthly authorities. Most likely, if they went and they were clean, they said, you're clean, go on. All ten. But only one, only one was pronounced as healed and saved. And that one, that ten percenter, was the only one who got to experience the eleventh miracle. The miracle of a restored relationship with God. Not restored to the earthly authority, but a restored relationship with God. A new understanding of God at work in Jesus Christ. A, a, a gift that began with gratitude and thanksgiving. Now I doubt that very few of us have experienced such a dramatic physical healing in our lives. If you have, you are blessed. But I would bet that most of us have experienced the transforming, healing, saving power of God through Jesus Christ somewhere along the way. If not, we probably wouldn't be here. Maybe it was in desperation as we sought resolution to one of life's many draining problems. Maybe it was in relief as we shook off a heavy burden of shame or guilt or depression. Maybe, maybe it was as we came to the realization that we couldn't earn salvation on our own through following all the right rules and saying all the right things. Or maybe it was just as we journeyed along this path we call faith, learning each and every step of the way that God just loves us, that God is with us, that God cares for us. But somewhere in our lives we've experienced, somewhere in our lives we have cried out to Jesus somewhere in our lives. Jesus with power and love and compassion and grace has made us clean. And if that hasn't happened yet, know that it can and it will by the power of God's grace. The question is this. If it has. Have we just gone on with life as normal as the nine did? Have we gone back to life as we knew it before, like nothing really happened? Or have we responded in faith, the kind of faith that causes us to fall on our knees in gratitude to God for all that has been done through Jesus Christ? The kind of faith that renews us and refreshes us and restores us and enhances our relationship with God. The kind of faith through which we are saved by God's grace. Well, you see, the other nine may have been cleansed from their leprosy, 
They, they may have been reinstated to their prior earthly status. They may have had their lives restored to them, but only one, one out of the ten, responded in such a way that Jesus says, your life has been saved. And then he asked, were not ten healed? Where are the nine? You see, Jesus wanted them all to experience the salvation that comes with turning around, giving him thanks, and living in a new way. Maybe those nine just felt like they got what they deserved in the first place. I don't know. Possibly they just got busy enjoying their, their newfound, resumed relationships with their family and friends and, and, and forgot to go back to Jesus. And most likely they went through those prescribed rituals. They sang the right hymns. They said the proper prayers. And then they went home to re resume life as normal. But Jesus said to the one, Jesus said to the ten percenter, the man who expressed his faith in gratitude and who was not able to thank him enough, he said, get up, get up, get on your way, because your faith has healed and saved you. Now, friends, if we desire to, to, to experience new life, we will realize that through God's grace, the cleansing has or, or is already taking place in our lives. And in faith, we will return to Jesus and fall on our knees and glorify God for all that's already been done and all that is being done now and all that will continue to be done in the future. And we will experience full healing, full restoration. And so in silence, here's what I want us to do. For just a moment, I want us to remember God's miraculous grace in our lives. Remember the things God has already done, that God is doing, the many ways God has cleansed us, healed us, and is moving us forward. And give thanks and praise. Take just a moment. that too many times I am in the nine that I forget to give thanks that I forget to turn back to you that I forget to live differently because of the way you have changed me and healed me and saved me from all that was before I pray Lord that we will be 10 percenters that we will be the one who understand that the new life in you turns when we turn around and fall before you and give you thanks and get up to follow you with the new life you offer. And this I pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
those who have watched, been worshiping, watching and worshiping with us on Facebook, I want to thank you for your presence today and bid you God's grace and God's blessing as you go through your week. Amen.